is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Welcome inside the studio, Maria Taylor alongside Mike Florio, Devin McCourty, and Jason Garrett. And we are here to recap what we saw in week six, which was very interesting because we entered with two undefeated teams and we walked out with none remaining in the league. Uh, let's start with the 49ers taking on the Browns and what we saw in that matchup. Remember, P.J. Walker was stepping in for Deshaun Watson. You're thinking this is a long shot. They walk away with the victory, but some injuries for the 49ers. And the 49ers were on the verge of setting a franchise record for consecutive regular season wins dating back to 1989, 1990. They had 15 in a row. It looked like it was going to be easy for them. They looked so dominant last Sunday night. And it really just does prove that you never know. Yep. You think you know, and you don't know. And what the Browns did, this is what Jeremiah Owusu-Koromo told me after the game. Defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz cracked the code, spotted the tendencies, deployed the players, and the Browns are physical enough to keep up with the 49ers. And they made Brock Purdy look human at a time when people were ready to give him the MVP trophy. Not that he may not ultimately get it, but today he didn't look like it. And, and the 49ers, due to the physicality of the Browns, come out of there, as you mentioned, with yeah. Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey, question marks. Yeah, I think one of the key things for San Francisco is don't make a big deal out of this. You lost one football game. You're starting quarterback. This was the first time he's lost in two seasons when he started and finished a game. Get back to the into the uh, meeting room, discuss the game, and then move on. Remind everybody, ignore all the noise going on outside this building. The biggest concern for the 49ers, what you just said, Fleur, they might have to hold all of their offensive meetings in the training room. Trent Williams, you make sure you nurse whatever happened on your ankle or foot. McCaffrey, Debo, get healthy. We'll just do the meeting in here so you get treatment and learn the uh, system for next week. <laughs> You know, the victors write the history, so I appreciate what Mike's saying and talking to some of the players, how they cracked the code. I think Jim Schwartz has done an incredible job. It's the best defense in the league. I don't think it had anything to do with that. Just watch the game. They were more physical. The word physicality jumps out at me. They dominated them up front. They disrupted them. The injuries were a factor. Uh, the hardest environment for Purdy to play in since he's been the starting quarterback. The weather, the injuries, it just didn't come quite as easily for him. He did do a good job at the end of the game. Let's not lose sight of the fact that he drove him down to <laughs> kick the game-winning field goal, and they missed it. So, to me, that shows what he's all about. You know, the gumption that he has as a quarterback continued to show up even on a, game, on a day where he wasn't at his best. Yeah, Jake Moody missed that wide right, and he's the rookie, um, so it was unfortunate to see it happen like that. But did we see a situation where, and maybe, Jason, I see what you're saying, is this a blueprint a little bit for how to work with them, or no, you're washing it because of weather and injuries? I just think it's about Cleveland's defense. Mm -hmm. For the first part of the season, they've been dominant. Uh, up front, they're disrupting pass games, run games. They're opportunistic on the back end, and that's what happened today. And certainly the weather and the injuries played to their favor and I thought they responded well to playing. P.J. Walker was the quarterback. Yeah, yeah. And they responded well to beat the team that has won 15 in a row. So impressive outing for them. There's a stat every week that gets my attention. And the Browns, through five weeks, have allowed just over 1,000 yards, the fewest since the Colts in 1971, wow. third fewest all time. And think about how the game's changed since 1971. It's hard to do. It is hard to play defense. And they held the 49ers at 215, and they're giving up on average just, just a hair over 200 a game. Mm -hmm. Well, let's keep it in the vein of defense, because really that was kind of what week six was about we saw the same thing happen with the Jets their stifling defense able to completely really shut down the Eagles we saw Jalen Hurts throw three picks tied a career high they were only able to rush for 33 yards what was the Jets defense able to do to just contain the Eagles offense well one thing my mom used to always tell me it catches up to you when it catches up to you <laughs> and each week we've been talking about this Philadelphia team just kind of squeaking by getting wins not necessarily playing well and then they played a Jets team a Jets defense that came in on fire, down two of their starting corners and said, you know what, up front, we're going to affect this game. We're going to pressure Hurts. We're going to take away the run game, make them one-dimensional. And I thought it was just a, a very phenomenal look for the Jets to come out and play that way on defense and then for Zach Wilson to continue to grow. Just don't lose the game and they'll have a chance to win. You know, the best teams play the game they want to play. And you said it. They dictated it. They stopped the run. Philadelphia could not run the ball. They're one of the best running teams in the league, and they have been over the last couple of years. They made them one-dimensional. And when you see Jalen Hurts dropping back time and time again, playing the game on their terms, that's not the formula for them. The pass rush, opportunistic on the back end, it's just not the way they want to play. They have to be balanced. They have to play to their offensive line, and the Jets took them out of that. And even though the Eagles were 5-0 and coming into that game, there was a different vibe to last year's Eagles and this year's. And it just felt like every one of those games they'd won, 
eh, a play here or a play there, and they would have lost that game. And I think that gave the Jets confidence that they could pull it off. Getting that win last week in Denver, going all the way back to the Kansas City game where they were down 17-0 and they kind of got it on track. This is amazing for them to be 3-3 three and three after six games without Aaron Rodgers, and with Rodgers out on the field, without crutches, without a boot, <laughs> throwing the ball, and he says he's coming back. To go into the bye week yeah. at 500 and to have real hope when it wasn't that long ago when Jets fans didn't know what to do. And now th they got something they can do. They can rally around this team and see where they go from here. Well, and Zach Wilson has a completely different look about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Prior to that Kansas City game, there was a lot of uncertainty. He played well in that game, even though they lost. Certainly played well enough last week and today. And he just got a spirit about him. I think the guys around him are starting to get a little confidence in him, saying, maybe this guy can do it for us. Yeah. Remember, we laughed. Him coming out of the tunnel earlier today, we're watching. <laughs> and he's smiling ear. He's like, they're cheering. Like, this is awesome. So, it's good for him. I like to make the joke. I'm like, the Jets are America's team now. Like, we're kind of rooting for him. You want yeah. good things to happen yeah. to him. But this was the first time they've ever gotten a win over the Eagles. Remember that? I mean, they were 0-12 up great. until this point. Uh, but to add on to that, they're starting quarterbacks out. So, no Sauce Gardner, no DJ Reed, and they're still able to pull off this victory. But I have to ask about what Robert Sala said uh, in the post game. He said, we might not have beat every single quarterback, but we've embarrassed them. Oh, I like <laughs> Love that <laughs> because Robert Sala is a defensive-minded coach, mm -hmm. and the one thing that they live by: all gas, no breaks. <laughs> and to live like that, it's not going to all go well. We we were talking about it on set. Dak Prescott looked pretty good against that defense. Not everyone. Create your own reality. That doesn't important. matter. Exactly. Let my guys believe in this. Don't let the like truth get in the way of a good five story. Five minutes ago, the, the victors get to write the yeah. history. So what the hell? We won today. We can say whatever we want. No, but a great win for the Jets and James Kaminsky. He's not here, but we know he's somewhere celebrating. He's dancing uh, in the streets. He's dancing right in the streets. Uh, let's talk about the Patriots taking on the Raiders. And starting with Jimmy G, uh, we saw him leave the game with an injury. Yeah, and it didn't look that serious when it happened after the hit he kept playing they finished the drive at the end of the second quarter and then all of a sudden it's like wait they took him to the hospital yeah. by ambulance he's got a, and back like you wonder what's going on inside and they're not saying anything beyond he's getting tests and it's a back injury hopefully we'll find out more tomorrow and hopefully whatever it is they get it properly rectified but anytime something like that happens when there's a sense of urgency to it something's wrong you just hope that it all turns out right yeah and it was a big win we talked about it earlier this Raiders team, you get the win, and everybody's kind of like, yeah, you beat the Patriots, no big deal. But then you look, they have Chicago coming up. They have the Giants on their schedule. They have Detroit mixed in there. But they now have a chance, I think, to gain some momentum. You win two games, try to build on that moving forward. We'll see what happens with Jimmy, but I thought it was big for Hoyer to come in. He went 6 of 10, 100 yards. Like, that's winning football. He didn't turn the ball over. He didn't mess the team up. Just kind of stay on chart, stay on pace, and see what happens at the end. Yeah, you know better than anybody. A win is a win in the National Football League. I don't care who you're playing, when you're playing, where you're playing. So register the win. Good for the Raiders. You know, New England, it wasn't a real clean game, but relative to the last couple of weeks, it was a marked improvement. Good they got, game for them. <laughs> yeah, they got, they got blown out of the stadium against Dallas and against the Saints at their own place. So for them, it was more competitive, it was better, but they're just not doing the things they need to do to win games at the end of games like you guys did for years. Yeah, and one of the rough things for New England is now Miami and Buffalo come up next. Yeah, so, it doesn't get any easier. Yeah. You just got to get a win at some point. Yeah. They just have to get a win, or you just feel like it's all going to fall apart. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing to see it happen. We've never seen a team that has been so identified with greatness just fall apart this way. Yeah, the Patriots sitting at 1-5. and five. We saw Bill Belichick last week talking about there's going to be some changes, going to make some changes. But did we see any changes <laughs> this we, week? We saw a little Malik Cunningham in the game. Um, I wouldn't call that a change, okay. but I think he even spoke about it after the game. I think they had like 80 yards and penalties. He said you can't win like that. And those are the things that we're not used to seeing from the Patriots. Yes, they might have had some up and down years, but the kind of undisciplined football of being a team that gets penalized, that is unheard of for a Coach Bill Belichick team. So they need to fix that, but they need to fix it in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the London games. I know that you guys had to wake up earlier. Week six was really long. You're up at 930, but you want to catch Baltimore taking on the Titans. And you liked what you saw from Lamar Jackson and this Ravens offense. Yes. Week one, it didn't look great for Baltimore. But, you know, we talked about it. It's a new offensive coordinator. You got to kind of get acclimated to each other, see how the season's going to go. 
But now Lamar Jackson looks comfortable in the pocket. It seems like he wants to be in that situation. He wants to throw the ball down the field. He doesn't want to do all the QB run game. But I do think the QB run game adds a different dimension in the red zone or, you know, third down or got to have it situations. But the way this team is playing, last week the receivers didn't show up, didn't catch the ball. They come out, catch the ball well today. They kind of control that game. The front, the defense has been playing well all year. But I think the way Lamar Jackson is playing is going to give this Baltimore team a chance to be contenders at the end. I get it. This is an arc that some quarterbacks go through. They're, they're runners. They have this elite running ability early on in the career, and they want to evolve away from that to be a passer. And he's done that. Mm -hmm. He's done that prior to this year. And he's really been an effective passer, both from the pocket and when he gets out in space. But the element that he brings that's unique is his ability to run the ball. So as you grow as a passer, as the passing game gets more complicated and you attack defenses different ways through the air, they have to keep that element because it scares the heck out of the defense. You know that better yep. than I do. So I saw a little bit of that today. Spontaneous running, a couple quarterback runs. They just need to sprinkle it in and make the defenses have to be aware of it, and that's going to make the passing game that much better. Yeah. You know, for the second straight week, we've heard – from the team that was in London before the opponent about the value of body acclimation, the time change, the jet lag, why wouldn't you just go? Yeah. Why, what, what's the argument against it, unless you're trying to save a few bucks? <laughs> why not go? And <laughs> then you can't say, well, if we'd have come earlier, we'd, we'd have possibly won this game. But, but it's real. If you go five time zones, it has an effect on you when you have to play a competitive sport like you that. You know, when, when we've done it, I advocated going over early, and that's what we did. And the people who go over later in the week, they always say, hey, a lot of distractions over there. Guys want to go see London. There are going to be a lot of late nights, all those things. And you have to deal with that. But the thing that I was most scared about was – we don't want to sleepwalk through this game. Yeah. We don't want to be in the middle of the third quarter like, okay, what time's our body clock? Mm -hmm. I'd rather l deal with the other things that you have to to make sure you get your team right. And uh, and I think it's, it's proving uh, to be the case. Jacksonville's certainly been a lot more effective over there when they've been over there and gotten their body clock right. And as a player, that shows trust in your players. When your coach decides like, hey, we're going to go over early. I'm not worried about you guys getting in trouble or doing different things. I trust that you want to win a football game just like I do. And I think you saw that. I talked to Kyle Van Noy when they first went over there, and he said it's been awesome. His family got to go. He got to do that time to focus on football. Whereas when you get there at the end of the week, sometimes you feel a little rush trying to get everything in because you still want to sightsee. Yeah, I went over there on a Friday. <laughs> the, whole, the whole Saturday, I, see. I walked around London. I spent time. Where's the king? It's my first time. Yeah, was, yeah exactly, like you're going to do it anyway. The week gives you time to spread it out and have some fun with it. <laughs> okay, well, also walking away, though, from that game, a lot of injuries to quarterbacks. Ryan Tannehill, we saw him go out in this game with the ankle injury. Yeah, he has a right ankle injury, and, and there was a, a period where he was standing outside of the <laughs> tunnel. It's like, why is he there? Well, the x-ray room was on the other side of the stadium, and they were waiting for the cart to come get him and take him over for the x-ray. He was on crutches in the locker room after the game due to have an MRI when they get back to Nashville. And the good news is they're off this weekend, so it gives him a little time. And we got to see some Malik Willis, and sure. it kind of feels like it's ending for Ryan Tannehill anyway. The only question is, is it going to be Malik or is it going to be Will Levis moving forward? They may have a heck of a quarterback competition next year that they didn't expect to have because Willis has really improved in the offseason and into this season, and it could be those two right down to the wire next year, assuming this is Tannehill's last year. And injuries like this will only make it more likely. I will say in London they love kicking, and they saw Justin Tucker kick six <laughs> field goals, so they have to be excited about that. Oh, okay? We're trying to make sure we keep you're, our London fans. Right there. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you a quick uh, story. We okay. played a game in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and this was the Cowboys in the 90s. We had Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, Deion Sanders, Michael Irvin, all these Hall of Don't Famers on our team. 110,000 people, when we kicked the extra point, 110,000 people were go on nuts. their feet. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. They love it. They love the kicking. They love Justin Tucker there. <laughs> Not the touchdowns. Not the, touchdown. Not the Hall of Fame. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Carolina and Miami. Uh, the Dolphins, the greatest show on turf, Jason. They had a little bit of a slow start. They let the Panthers get out to a 14-zip lead. But at this point, they can spot points to people <laughs> and still find a way to boat race them. I think it's incredible what they're doing. They scored 42 points. It was a yawner. It was easy for them. And you, you said it. They got down 14. Nobody blinked. What was most impressive to me is they made so many big plays down the field throughout the season. They drove the ball. They were five for five scoring touchdowns in the red zone. They do it creatively with scheme. 
guys making plays, Tua out of the pocket, all these receivers, the runners, the whole thing that they have. So that was impressive to me, to be able to score different ways. It's not always about the big explosive play. And when they have the balance they have and they're able to score in the red zone and from out, it's a hard offense to stop. We've seen that all year long. Yeah, and I think we all know how good Miami is. And you look on the other side with Carolina, you look at Bryce Young, comes out, they jump out 14 zip, which, you know, you're starting to feel good for this guy. But I just think it's so much on him right now as a rookie quarterback. He's getting hit a lot. The team's not winning. You know, they're 0-6 now. When is that time of, like, man, did we put him out there too early? Are we not good enough around him? Are we going to start to affect his future with how the game is going? Uh, Miami's a team that you don't want to start like that, but I think they're a team that has so much confidence in their ability and they trust each other. You can really see this team starting to come together, but I do worry about Bryce Young a little bit. You know, the Chiefs made the strategic decision last year to move on from Tyree Kill. He wanted the ball more than he was getting it. He wanted more money than they were ready to pay, and they won the Super Bowl without him, so... Mission accomplished. But when you look at what the Dolphins do now, that's what the Chiefs used to do. You know, you, eh, you take your time, and then all of a sudden you find the gas pedal and you score 35 points. I mean, and Tyree kills the common link. They, they are capable of having those kinds of explosions, even if they're down double digits with Tyree Kill around. And as Sim said all day long, as you guys pointed out earlier, and so we can say it again here, all day long, he was talking about how Tyree Kill's the potential league MVP from that team. And it'll be interesting to see if they do get the one seed in the AFC, does he get the lion's share of the votes over to Tonga Bailoa, because usually it goes to the quarterback. <laughs> but Tyree Kill is one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, that we're seeing the Dolphins doing what they're doing. You know, the other thing that, that we've got to recognize, and we've talked about it before, Mike McDaniel, incredible job. Two is playing great. Tyreek's ridiculous. But the way they've built that team, Chris Greer, the general manager, speed, speed, speed. All these guys, Mostert, Achan, Waddle, uh, Tyreek, I mean, it, it's the Santa Monica Track Club. It's Carl Lewis, you know, those guys trotting down. I mean, it's ridiculous. They're just faster than everybody. And when you have so many different weapons that the defense has to handle, they just throw their hands up. They can't do it for 60 minutes. And uh, it's, it's been really, really impressive. The only down game they played is when they went up to Buffalo. So, you know, you start playing those games in the division up north as the season goes on. We'll see how it holds up. But so true. They've been impressive so far. Maybe I could be a general manager because my Madden theory for 30 years is coming to fruition. Just get the fastest guys. <laughs> you're going to win if you get the fastest guys in Madden. You're going to win if you get the fastest guys in real football, too. Yeah, so they, they have McDaniel club. calling the plays, though. You yeah, were calling true. the plays. Yeah, 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 <laughs> if you get the job, they'll hire me. I, I, I'll take a job. Just don't fire me. <laughs> the way they burst your bubble so fast and you just let it happen. <laughs> I just got to enjoy it for <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is week seven, we do get the Dolphins and we get the Eagles, mm. so they're going up north and it's going to be a absolute great one. All right, let's get some fantasy football news. And for that, we always go to our go-to guy, Matthew Barry. Hey, thank you, Maria. All right, just some quick headlines from week number six. First off, all the injuries. You guys have been talking about it as well, but big fantasy superstars leaving the game early. Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, David Montgomery, Kyron Williams, and then, of course, all the quarterbacks, right? Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence. Jimmy Garoppolo, Baker Mayfield, Ryan Tannehill as well. Obviously, those injuries would affect the pass catchers on those teams. So that is something to watch. We don't know what the statuses of all those guys are, but we'll learn more tomorrow. Don't look now, but Kyle Pitts, free Kyle Pitts, has finally had back-to-back -back good games, as has Drake London. All of a sudden, is this a flash in the pan or the Atlanta Falcons suddenly passing? We'll find out more on that tomorrow. Hey, no Devon Achan. No problem. Raheem Mostert, three touchdowns today for the Dolphins. He now leads the NFL with 11 touchdowns from scrimmage. Mostert is a must start. And then finally, another big game from Adam Thielen. I know it's been a tough year for the Panthers, but Thielen has been a bright spot. 100 or more yards in three of the last four games. We're going to break down all these storylines and so much more from week number six tomorrow on Fantasy Football Happy Hour, live at noon on Peacock and then available on demand on Peacock, on the NFL and NBC YouTube channel, and wherever you get your podcasts. Time now for the DraftKings crowning moments. I have them in my hand, my hot little hand here. Here are actual bets from actual bettors. Someone out there put a $1,000 bet on the Panthers to be the first team to score versus the Dolphins, they won $3,800. That was at plus 280. Somebody put a $100 bet on Chris McCaffrey's first touchdown. Always a pretty good bet that CMC gets in the end zone. Well, the first touchdown bet on Sunday, 1 p.m. games, that CMC was the first to do it, $2,900. That was at plus 2,800. And then a $10 bet on Nelson Aguilar, most first quarter receiving yards. That was his plus 3,000. Somebody walked away with $310. Don't forget, on DraftKings Sportsbook this season, 
New customers can bet $5 and pocket $200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers can get a no-sweat same-game parlay every day. Just download the app. Use the promo code SNF when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. Coming up, more from Orchard Park, including a look ahead to Dolphins-Eagles next Sunday night. Welcome back to the studio. It is time for our speed round. That means fast, Jason Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's going to be fact or fiction, and all of these start with too soon. Is it too soon? Is it too soon to call the Lions a Super Bowl contender? No, it's not too soon. You look at the 49ers losing, the Eagles losing. Here are the Lions tied with both of them. They'll get their opportunities later in the year to prove that they belong, but they've won five out of six games. They won in Kansas City. They're a Super Bowl contender. I, I agree. It's not too soon. They're a contender. We're not saying that they're, we're not crowning them Super Bowl champs, mm -hmm. but they're going to be in the picture at the end. So looking forward to see this, this Detroit team continue to get better and what it looks like at the end of the season. Yeah, not too soon at all. And to me, it's about their defense. Offense continues to play well. Tampa was not world beaters on the offensive side of the ball, but another good performance by Aaron Glenn's Detroit Lions defense, the most improved unit in the NFL, played better last year, played awfully well this year. They're absolutely in the mix. Okay. Is it too soon to call the Texans the biggest threat to the Jags in the AFC side? No, I mean, the Texans already beat them by 20 points in Jacksonville. And C.J. Stroud keeps getting better and better and better. Disappointed they lost last week to Atlanta, but... Ended up getting the win today at home against the Saints, and they've matched their win total from last year. I think they're a team that's going to get better as the season rolls on. Yeah, Flora, you just said it. They already beat the Jaguars, so we might have this all worded wrong. Like, they're in it not just as a threat to the Jags. Yeah. They're in it to win it. And I think you look at D'Amico Ryans, you look what Nick Casario has built this team up to be, the draft picks this year, the veterans, Schultz that they brought in, uh, Robert Woods, that they, they brought in key veterans that have been on good football teams, that have seen how it's done, and they're showing these young guys, and these young guys are even stepping up. Stroud and Will Anderson, they're captains. They're rookies, and they're captains of the football team. So I like everything I see from this Houston team. Yeah, to me, it starts with their defense. Week in and week out, they're playing good defensive football. D'Amico brings that to that team, and then Stroud. I mean, you kidding me? This guy's a rookie yeah. in the NFL, making it look like it's nothing in his transition. You know, as calm as can be, he makes plays. When he has adversity, he just keeps playing. So when you got good quarterback play and you're playing good defense, that travels. They're off to a heck of a start. All right, is it too soon for the Falcons to make a quarterback change? You know, I hate to say this because I like Desmond Ritter, and I think they believe he's got great intangibles, and they're hoping the tangibles follow at some point. But, boy, today... That interception he threw in the fourth quarter to the wide-open Washington defender and all the different facial expressions we saw. Mm. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I, it's, it's, uh, it's not too soon to be thinking about Taylor Heineke. I feel bad saying that, but it's not too soon. Huh? All right, good thing. We're not going to all agree on all of these questions. It's yeah. too soon. Mm -hmm. Even the interception he threw in the end zone, terrible play by him. But if you look at that play, he's waiting for the call. Then they're scrambling to the line of scrimmage, and he panics and throws the ball up. But how about as a team, let's not put that on our young quarterback. Let's not have him rush into the line of scrimmage. Then the other interception at the end of the game, they're throwing a slant, 30 seconds left in the game. Even if it's a completion, they got to now try to get on the ball. But like it's, it was a bad play call and everything. So I hope they don't take this guy out and act like Ritter's the only problem. He had 300 yards today, two touchdowns. Yes, the three interceptions, we got to fix that. But he's getting better. And that's what you ask of your young players to do, to get better. And he's been doing that. We're watching this from afar, so we don't know how it all, the inner workings are going, but it looks like there's something amiss. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's a little miscommunication. Are we on the same page? Are we putting him and the offense in the right situation? Is it the right fit for what we're doing? And again, we're observing it from out here, but there's some skill players there, and, and he's a young, talented quarterback. And so I just think they need to step back and say, well, is Taylor Heineke the answer? He may or may not be, but we got to think about what we're doing to make the environment better for our quarterback. They're still sitting at three and three, though, even with some of the issues that I you're panic. <laughs> so I don't know. Stretched at one point today where they had to delay a game. And then they must have a delay game on the very next, next play. play. <laughs> then they took a timeout after they spiked the ball. They spike it. So now you have the full play clock. And then they had to take a timeout so they didn't get a penalty. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like they kept getting the ball back. There's three yeah. minutes to go, and it's like they had three more series because yeah. Washington wasn't doing much on the offensive side. So they kept getting these opportunities, and they kept, you know, floundering. So 
Uh, they got to step back. They got to look at it. They got to reset a little bit mm -hmm. offensively. Okay, you guys gave me just a little bit of hope, I think, for my hometown Falcons. Yeah. Just, just a teensy little bit, and I appreciate <laughs> it. All right, that's our, our recap of week six. You guys did a great job with the speed round. Uh, make sure that you watch Football Night in America. Next week, we've got the Dolphins. We've got the Eagles. We've got week seven of Sunday Night Football coming your way, 7 Eastern on NBC and Peacock. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.